Hello everybody, uh, Bruce Robison here uh, with my weekly video as we uh, look ahead now to Sunday, October 18th, uh, which uh, just to locate us on the church calendar is the 20th Sunday after Pentecost and uh, associated uh, with the 1979 Book of Common Prayer proper number 24. Uh, in our lectionary calendar, we're in year A and at All Saints Brighton Heights uh, during the season between Trinity Sunday and Advent Sunday this year, uh, we're following what's called track two uh, for our Old Testament readings and for the Psalms. So that just uh, gives us a little orientation for the day. Uh, here in Western Pennsylvania, of course, it's really beginning to look and feel like fall. There's beautiful colors in the trees this year and very pleasant temperatures during the daytime. Then a little frost on the pumpkin at night uh, may seem like it was summer about 15 minutes ago, but after church last Sunday, Brenda Harris, our uh, All Saints Church organist, and I uh, began to uh, do a little bit of planning about music for Christmas Eve. So time marches on, and we know that uh, winter uh, will be here before we know it. So uh, the calendar is also uh, looking forward a little bit uh, in our uh, lectionary during this season as we begin to see uh, on the church calendar Advent Sunday on the horizon uh, uh, just uh, six weeks or so from now. And the, the, the themes and we might say the color and the tone of the prayers and the readings uh, appointed for us each week are gradually beginning to point us in that direction toward the end, the end of the year, uh, toward the end of the story, um, and even leaving, uh, leading us on toward the end of the larger story uh, that is lined out for us in all the, the pages of, of Scripture. Uh, so in the four Sundays of Advent, uh, uh, beginning again just uh, a few weeks from now, uh, one of the patterns we traditionally uh, find and draw on in our readings and in our preaching and in our hymns uh, uh, will be uh, what are called the four last things, uh, death and judgment, heaven and hell. That's, that's the way we begin the new year in the Christian year, with a reflection on the end at the time of beginning death and judgment, heaven and hell. It's all up ahead of us. And, and in these later weeks of the, the long season after Trinity Sunday, uh, we begin to see in our readings and prayers again, uh, a movement uh, in the kind of, uh, in the way of a kind of preparation to reflect on these things. So, so we may begin uh, during these weeks to have uh, begun to sense a shift in tone. Uh, the Gospel reading for this week from Matthew chapter 22 uh, centers on a, a moment of conversation in a larger episode. We've been reading for a few weeks about this episode that marks a dramatic turning point in the drama of Holy Week. And uh, uh, as we in Holy Week are standing uh, just ahead of Good Friday, we, we might just notice a connection with the collect of the day for this Sunday, which in ancient practice was the first of the nine solemn collects for the liturgy of Good Friday. Uh, Good Friday, the day uh, when, as Jesus says in John chapter 12, he will be lifted up on the cross and the day of judgment will begin. So the storm hasn't begun yet, but the storm clouds are definitely beginning to appear overhead. At the same time this Sunday, the Old Testament reading uh, from Isaiah chapter 45 uh, centers on a picture of God using the military might of the Persian Emperor Cyrus the Great to rescue his chosen people and to bring judgment on the nations who have persecuted them. Uh, Psalm 96 uh, sings the praises of God as judge of all the earth, and the opening uh, verses of Paul's first letter to the Christians of Thessalonica is intended as a word of encouragement to them, a community of faith who have been a bright light in the midst of much opposition and persecution. And Paul reminds them of the hope that all Christians share in the power of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, to save and protect his people from the wrath of God and the fiery judgment of the last day. So beginning to prepare ourselves to think about last things, uh, stepping back to take in the bigger picture and to look with courage and hope and with our sober judgment at God's 
final purposes for us and for all his creation. So our, our 1979 Book of Common Prayer in the Episcopal Church, I think has added a real richness uh, uh, as a gift to the wider Anglican community by incorporating uh, uh, several of these very ancient prayers into our life of worship. Uh, over the last couple of months, we've seen several examples, uh, prayers uh, based on translations from medieval and early Latin texts uh, by the 19th century Oxford scholar and I think poet, uh, William Bright. Uh, our collect this week dates back to liturgical texts in the time of Pope Gelasius. Uh, he was Pope in the fifth century from AD 492 to 496. And again, uh, during that period, this was the first of the nine solemn collects for Good Friday. Uh, now, like most traditional collects, uh, this one has four parts, an introduction, which is an invocation and an address to God, uh, then a petition, a request, and then a reason for that request or an amplification of that request, and then finally a conclusion that places our prayer in the care of Christ Jesus, uh, through whom all our intercessions are acceptable and presented to the Father. Now, uh, the address in this collect uh, really connects well to our Isaiah 45 and Psalm 96 readings, uh, turning to God as the God of glory and power, not just over us, not just the God of one particular group or people, but as the one God of authority over all the earth. Uh, we often speak of God's care, God's mercy, his compassion, and rightly so, but uh, while we do that, always remembering the context and never losing the sight of God's power, his authority, his judgment. Uh, the petition in this uh, collect this week is short and sweet. Uh, protect us, preserve us. Uh, uh, those of us who come to you through the cross of Christ, uh, that's what's meant by the phrase that we'll hear, the works of thy mercy. Uh, that's us, his church, uh, those who come to him in faith, who are, are saved and protected by him as the works of his mercy, the vast multitude from every nation and people whom no man can number. We'll hear echoes of this again in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Preserve thy church so that we may continue to give witness to your power and glory. We might say with Jesus, as we'll hear him in his exchange with the leaders of Jerusalem in Matthew 22, that we may render unto God the things that are God's. So we pray the collect of the day, that for proper 24, the Sunday nearest October 19th. Almighty and everlasting God, who in Christ hast revealed thy glory among the nations, preserve the works of thy mercy, that thy church throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in the confession of thy name. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Now, having offered that prayer at the beginning of our 1030 service this Sunday morning at All Saints, we'll, we'll sit to hear the first reading uh, from Isaiah chapter 45, the first nine verses. Uh, it's really a dramatic reading. It's a startling one in many ways, uh, beginning to startle us really at the very first line. So a reading from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and ungird the loins of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut asunder the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I gird you, though you do not know me, that men may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none other besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make wheel and create woe. I am the Lord who do all these things. The word of the Lord. Thanks 
be to God. So Cyrus the Great, the, the emperor of Persia, the mighty conqueror whose new empire extends from modern day Turkey all the way east to India, whose military victory over the Babylonian Empire has freed the refugee exiles from Jerusalem and opened the way for their return. Cyrus is called here God's anointed, his Messiah, to use the Hebrew word, his Christ, to use the Greek word. Uh, he's the one set apart by God, especially to be the instrument of God's purposes, to punish those who have harmed his chosen people and to make possible their return to the promised land. This judgment uh, is an anticipation for us, I think, a, a foreshadowing of the last judgment when uh, God's uh, enemies are finally overturned, finally swept away, uh, freeing his people to worship, freeing his people to serve him in freedom and peace. So again, after this reading, just flowing along in the spirit of it, on Sunday morning, we'll respond at All Saints with a responsive reading of Psalm 96. So we celebrate not simply with nations and peoples, but with all the created order as God acts in his power to establish his rule over all. Let the heavens rejoice, we'll say. Let the earth be glad. So Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the whole earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations and his wonders among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is more to be feared than all gods. As for all the gods of the nations, they are but idols. But it is the Lord who made the heavens. Oh, the majesty and magnificence of his presence. Oh, the power and splendor of his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, you peoples of the people, families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord honor and power. Ascribe to the Lord the honor, do his name, bring offerings and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth tremble before him. Tell it out among the nations, the Lord is king. He has made the world so firm that it cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea thunder and all that is in it. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood shout for joy before the Lord when he comes, when he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and his peoples with his truth. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Now, as the, the memories and uh, traditions of the New Testament, of course, go back all the way to the time of the earthly life and ministry of Jesus. There's, there's something of a scholarly consensus that the letters of Paul are the earliest completed Christian writings that we have, uh, probably written in the 50s and 60s of the first century. And uh, a consensus as well that of the letters of Paul, the first letter to the Thessalonians is probably the earliest of his writings. Uh, so the first uh, sentences of that letter are our epistle reading for this Sunday. And just to note that uh, we'll continue to be reading in 1 Thessalonians now for a few weeks in our lectionary cycle. Uh, so as we read these sentences, we can hear already just, just maybe 15 or 20 years after Holy Week and Easter and Pentecost, something of the, the spirit, the energy, the life of the early church. Uh, here already extending and expanded far from Jerusalem in the area of Macedonia, uh, about 100 miles southwest from the city of Philippi, up in the uh, upper uh, part of what uh, in the ancient world they called Achaia, the, the Greek peninsula. Uh, uh, just, uh, we've heard so much, of course, about Philippi, just 100 miles south, uh, northeast of, of uh, Thessalonica. Uh, and uh, as we read in Philippians and Acts 16 over the past few weeks in our lectionary. Uh, in Acts chapter 17, uh, we read about how Paul and Silas left Philippi and came to Thessalonica. 
Uh, they did some preaching and teaching there at the local synagogue, and they began to gather some early converts and, and uh, in time of teaching and formation, but then they were chased out of town by the Jewish leaders and the city authorities. Uh, so this letter is written a few years later. It's written to the Thessalonian Christians uh, from Paul Silvanus. Silvanus is the Latin form of Silas and from Timothy, the young companion who had joined uh, Paul and Silas in their missionary work just a little bit uh, after the time of their first visit to Thessalonica. Uh, you can, can hear a great deal of affection in Paul's opening words with thanksgiving for the faithfulness uh, for the life and witness of the Thessalonian church in the face of great opposition with a reminder of the power of the Holy Spirit's work in them. Uh, so that while they may have been a small group and may have been opposed and persecuted in many ways, their inspiring reputation, their story was well known among Christian communities far and wide. Paul says he doesn't have to tell their story because everyone knows it already. Uh, their inspiring reputation among all the Christian communities and, and they were remembered in prayer uh, by those communities and by Paul and Silas and Timothy with sincerity and thanksgiving. We especially note at the end of this uh, reading, verses 9 and 10, uh, a formula reflecting the life and the faith, the ministry, the practice of this early church. And of course, uh, reflecting on that as a, as a way of speaking about the calling and the mission and the character, the life and faith of the church in every generation. So a reading from 1 Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy uh, to the church of the Thessalonians, and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for you all, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brethren beloved by God, that he has chosen you, for our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia, Macedonia and in Achaia, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us what a welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols, to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, in terms of our end of the year pre Advent time of preparation, just to pause over those last two verses, for they themselves report concerning us what a welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols, that repentance, to serve a living and true God, and then to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. We talk about Advent as a time of waiting. We wait for the, the remembrance of the birth of Jesus at Christmas, but we wait as well for his coming again in power and glory. And uh, that, that uh, uh, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath of, to come is, is just central to that time of spirit of waiting. Uh, God's wrath is, of course, motivated uh, by the perfect death, depth of his divine character, uh, his hatred of sin, his hatred of evil, his hatred of death and destruction. Those are the eternal enemies of his people, the eternal enemies of his creation. And, and just as the Babylonians had been the enemy of the chosen people in ancient days, uh, they are his enemies now and forever. And we hear a promise in what we call the last judgment uh, that God will sweep all of that away in a complete and eternal way. 
as thoroughly as Cyrus the Persian had swept away the lesser empires of his day. God now promising to uh, open the way to usher in a new creation, a kingdom cleansed and purified and holy. We hear in this reading as well the confidence that it is Christ and his cross that stand between us and that judgment. Uh, we'll see in the next few weeks as we read through this letter, the Thessalonians, I imagine all the early Christians lived in eager, eager anticipation of this last judgment, uh, trusting the promise spoken by the angel at the Mount of the Ascension that Jesus would return in the same way that he departed from them in power and great glory. And of course, praying that, uh, that that return would happen very soon. Uh, perhaps a, a, a certain edge of that uh, anticipation uh, over the decades and centuries since may have, have uh, lost uh, uh, something uh, uh, for us. Uh, sometimes for us, the idea of the last judgment seems something far off, uh, not so much something that's right around the corner. But, but that's not the way it was for the Thessalonians. It's always Advent for them. They're always waiting for Jesus, who is always about to be with them. They wake up every morning with a sense of urgency and a sense of eagerness for his coming. Will today be the great day? Now, uh, in our gospel reading from Matthew 22, uh, following verses 15 through 22, we're continuing in this series of conversations and the dialogues, the debates between Jesus and the, the leaders of Jerusalem at the temple during Holy Week. It's the hours and the days before Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. And it's interesting, as I said before, that our collect of the day uh, this week is traditionally uh, from uh, use of, used for Good Friday. So that's appropriate to this setting. The, and the Pharisees, uh, that's to say the religious leaders, the leading rabbis, the scholars of the law, have joined forces in this moment with a group called the Herodians. Uh, they're the Jews who were in leadership in Herod's civil government in the midst of the Roman occupation. And these two groups together are seeking to discredit Jesus, to trip him up, uh, to get him to say something that might be uh, enough to have him arrested, uh, be removed, uh, so he doesn't have to be in this public place during the week of Passover festival with all the pilgrims gathering. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've heard in chapters 21 and 22, three very powerful parables that Jesus uses at the beginning of this dialogue, the parable of the two sons, Remember the one who said that uh, at first that he wouldn't do what his father had asked him, but then who repented and acted. And the second who said uh, all the right words when his father was in the room, but then who went his own way and didn't do what the father asked. So the two sons. And then we had the parable of the wicked tenants, uh, those who refused to pay their rent, the ones who murdered the emissaries of the vineyard owner and who finally uh, murdered his son. And uh, now they must be thrown out and replaced by better tenants who would honor the covenant with their landlord. And then finally, last Sunday, we heard the parable of the wedding feast, uh, the invited guests not responding to the king's invitation, then replaced by a crowd just rounded up in the streets. The one guest in this new bunch who refuses to put on the wedding garment and so is ejected and sent along with uh, those earlier invited guests uh, to that place where men weep and wail and gnash their teeth. So again, Jesus, uh, the leaders were perceiving that Jesus is telling these parables to shine the spotlight on them as unfaithful stewards, as the disobedient sons, as the wicked tenants as those who uh, refuse the wedding invitation or who refuse to comply with the wishes of the king when they do. All of this uh, uh, obviously motivates them even more to try to trip Jesus up. Uh, so the, these three parables then in Matthew's gospel are then followed by three hard questions, three debating points, uh, which the uh, Jewish leaders, uh, uh, by which the Jewish leaders seek to bring Jesus down. And we have the first of these uh, in our reading this morning. So we hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Then the Pharisees went and took counsel how to entangle him in his talk, and they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and care for no man, for you do not regard the position of men. 
Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why do you put me to test, to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the money for the tax. And they brought him a, a coin, and Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled. They left him and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Well, this is such a brief reading, but it's so interesting. I can't even get into all of it in one sitting, but uh, we, we know that, that the uh, uh, Pharisees and their disciples and the Herodians are, are hoping with this question to get Jesus into trouble by uh, perhaps speaking against the tax. Uh, now, if he had said, pay the tax, on the other hand, uh, they'll, they'll, they know he'll lose support among the people because they hate the Romans. Uh, so if he, he does that, the audience may cheer, but the soldiers will soon be there to take Jesus away. Now, interestingly, Jesus catches them up, uh, not by answering their question, but by asking them a question in return. This is a strategy a good debater will often use, and Jesus uses here. He asks to see a coin, actually uh, a denarius is what the Greek text tells us. It was a denarius, and that's quite a valuable coin. Uh, a denarius was a skilled worker's daily wage. So we might, in our contemporary context, begin to imagine this scene by hearing Jesus say, here, let me see the money you're going to use to pay the tax. And when they, these uh, Herodians and Pharisees open their wallets, all they have is a hundred dollar bill. Now uh, that is... Uh, uh, with a picture of Caesar on it, and the inscription on that Roman coin that said, Caesar is God. So, so they all of a sudden look like quite prosperous, maybe even look like elites in the midst of the crowd. And certainly an observant Jew would think to have a possession of this particular coin would be something of a scandal. Uh, Caesar is God with the image of the emperor. Uh, uh, clearly these leaders are doing quite well in the world, despite the Roman occupation. Uh, they're already quite clearly giving a lot of themselves to Caesar. Uh, and the word Jesus shares here is to say, well, what about giving God what is due God? That's sort of the same question we might have asked the wicked tenants. Um, what about giving to God? What about giving to the vineyard owner uh, what is his. Uh, and in any case, the disciples of the Pharisees and these Herodian leaders are clearly stymied. Uh, uh, Matthew says they marvel, uh, I guess, at how this rustic rabbi from the back country keeps slipping out of the traps they set for him, and they depart, I like to imagine, perhaps to the jeers of the crowd. This, as I said, the first three questions that are presented to Jesus in the section of Matthew. We'll hear about the next two next week. But, but uh, this one lingers for us and uh, challenges us, I think, always about our own commitment and faithfulness in the stewardship of our lives. Uh, challenges us in terms of the question of where our loyalties are, about how we understand our place in relationship to this world and in relationship to God. Uh, we're always enmeshed in the, uh, in the taxes that we pay to Caesar and our uh, encounters with the wide world around us, but so often we're very fuzzy about our relationship to the owner of the vineyard and how we are called to uh, live in relationship to him. I heard a, a sermon one time where the preacher said that at the pearly gates, St. Peter won't need to look into some great ledger to see what our lives were all about. He would simply produce our check registers, checkbook registers from over the course of our lifetimes. And from them, looking at them, he would be able to tell pretty much all he needed to know about our values and priorities and loyalties, about what we paid to Caesar and what we paid to God. So, so there's a lot to reflect on in these readings this week, anticipating Advent still just a few weeks away as we approach the end of the year, as we have in mind before us the four last things of death and judgment, heaven and hell. So blessings to you, uh, and let us pray. 
O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray thee to set thy passion, cross, and death between thy judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead. To thy holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit livest and reignest one God now and forever. Amen.